All right, guys, we're back in the shop today and we're gonna be making a little bit more progress on the Copo truck. That's my single cab step side Silverado that we're building as if the Copo program still existed where you could mix and match whatever parts you wanted from GM's bin and you know not just get like a cool drag race Camaro. So a Copo truck never existed in real life, but basically it's kind of like a Cyclone or a Silverado SS. You know, we're gonna have all wheel drive, an LSA supercharger, 4L80 transmission, and a bunch of other cool factory odds and ends that are just gonna make this kind of a well-rounded, all-around performance truck. Uh, so the supercharger is kind of what we're in the middle of. And if you're new here, check out the last two videos. I'll put a link in the description. Um, the first video we actually showed installing the LSA blower onto a Cathedral Port LS, fairly simple. And then the next video we just showed the accessory drive and how we're actually gonna get that upper blower pulley to spin with the crankshaft because, well, if the blower pulley's not spinning, that's basically a useless restrictive intake. So we got those two major systems taken care of, but today we gotta take care of a few odds and ends so we can actually get the lid permanently installed on the blower. We're gonna talk about heat exchangers, and we're also gonna show one very important upgrade that just about every LSA owner needs to do. I don't care if you've got a ZL1, a CTSV, or a swap application. I don't care if you're running a stock boost level or a completely cranked up boost you got to do this one modification to help your engine live. And then after we take care of that, we'll talk about the fuel system because right now all we have are a couple of fuel lines from the tank just kind of hanging out there at the back of the engine and they're not connected to the rail. And we also don't have a fuel pressure regulator in place. So we'll get that knocked out. And if our throttle body shows up today, we'll actually get that installed because I am going to be upgrading I'm not gonna be using the stock truck. I think that's like a 78 millimeter throttle body. I did order a larger one. Um, should be here, let's see, today's Tuesday. I think that's here tomorrow. Anyway, um, sidetrack, let's start by talking about the heat exchanger and what you have to do if you own a CTSV or a ZL1 or an LSA. So just about every LSA has a problem with the intercooler bricks collapsing. And this doesn't matter if you have a ZL1 lid or a CTSV lid, but if you've ever seen that experiment where the guy takes an empty plastic bot water bottle and like dives down to the bottom of a lake, you'll notice that the water bottle will collapse because there's a pressure differential. Basically, there's a lot more pressure on the outside than there is on the inside. And the same thing is happening inside the lid of your supercharger. So the air pressure that's surrounding this and passing through the core is greater than the pressure of the liquid that's being passed through it. And as such, it kind of wants to crumple this just like a plastic water bottle. Now the end tank on this side that actually has the water fittings, this is pretty strong because there's like a little divider in there because it's a dual pass design. But the far side, that is where the problems usually occur. And basically the end tank just kind of gets pushed in, which will restrict coolant from kind of going through the core, making the turn and coming back the opposite direction. Um, so to prevent this from happening, I took my core out and I sent it off to dedicated motorsports and they did that. They just took a little plate of like eighth inch or 3 16th aluminum and TIG welded it on there with a nice little rosette weld in the middle to kind of just reinforce that whole end tank to prevent it from collapsing. Um, it cost about 150 bucks to take it and send it to those guys, but they turned it around real quick and I should have or probably could have done it myself. but. When it comes to welding aluminum, I'm a little bit nervous, especially if it's a part where I don't know exactly, you know, how clean it is or what it's made from. So I just figured it'd be safer to send it to those guys and let them weld it up because they also pressure test it and make sure that there's no leaks. Because if you have like a little pinhole and some coolant or water is spraying out of it, well, guess what? That's going directly into your engine. I mean, because the intercooler core sits right there and any liquid that gets sprayed out is going straight down in the engine, which is definitely no good. So let the experts take care of it. They'll pressure test it to make sure there's no leaks. Yeah, I probably could have done it, especially considering you can buy those plates for like 20 or $30 online. So woulda, coulda, shoulda, but I am definitely happier just by paying those guys to handle it. So now all we've got to do is just kind of bolt the brick back into the lid, bolt the little water manifold into the lid and kind of seal it up there. And we can put that on the truck for good.
I'm gonna be using some blue thread locker on the bolts that hold the brick into the lid, just because these bolts are basically upside down. And if they ever backed out, they'd pretty much just fall into the engine and probably cause some major damage to the valves and potentially even the pistons, like if a valve got jammed open because a bolt fell down inside there. So I'm just using some blue Loctite. I think that's what was on there from the factory and that should just kind of hold everything in place. And then once we have it all bolted in, we'll get the lid bolted onto the supercharger, which is very simple because we already had it on there. And I believe all the hardware will torque down to 89 inch pounds. So I don't actually have any of the other components for the heat exchanger system mounted to the truck yet. So I'm going to put that stuff off to a later day because I'll have to take the grill off. I'm going to have to build a bracket for the low temp radiator. At the same time, I'm going to mount the trans cooler and I still haven't got a bracket for the uh, reservoir or the pump. So there's a lot of like little fab work and the way I do stuff, it's like, it takes me a long time because I'm really particular about where stuff is mounted and I try to make sure we've got plenty of clearance for hoses and nothing rubs through and like, I, I'm, I don't know, OCD I think is probably the way to describe it or probably way too picky is what other people might say. But a perfect example of that, I guess, is the little bracket that I built for the fuel lines. Um, I just spent the last couple hours doing it and when you look at it, it definitely doesn't seem like something that'll take a couple of hours because it's basically a simple bracket with a bend in it that holds those two fuel lines in a cushion clamp. Uh, but I wanted to make sure they had plenty of clearance around the back of the supercharger. I wanted to make sure nothing would rub. And yeah, that's like two hours of my life because I made two or three different versions of it just to get it to where I was happy with it. So anyway, um, needless to say, I didn't want to take care of the rest of the uh, mounting for those components just yet until we start the truck up with a supercharger in place. And to do that, of course, we need to get things like the fuel system done because obviously you need fuel to fire the engine. Um, the 99-02 Silverados used a return style fuel system. I think 03 is when they converted to a return less. A lot of later model cars like the CTSV and the ZL1 and the ZR1 Corvette all had a return less fuel system. So there's only one line going to the rail. And so because we have two lines feeding it, obviously we need a regulator. Uh, this is the setup that the truck used. It's pretty simple. Uh, feed line, return line, regulator, and there's of course the vacuum reference, but we can't use any of that. And the next best thing that a lot of people would probably like to use is that Corvette regulator assembly. They're inexpensive and they have, they're preset at like 58 PSI, but there's two reasons why I didn't want to use it. Number one, I don't like how they look. I'm trying to make this sort of like a factory-ish or basically a really clean installation. And I don't like how the regulator filter thing looks. And number two, uh, from what I've read, they actually won't support a higher volume fuel pump. They won't bypass enough fuel at idle where we've got a 450 liter per hour pump in there and I didn't want to take any chances. So we just grabbed some aftermarket stuff. Um, yeah, this doesn't look factory, but I think it's going to look real clean. This is all a kit from Aeromotive. It has the regulator itself. It's got a vacuum reference on there, eighth inch NPT for the gauge, and it has three dash six ORB ports. So we've got the feed, we've got the rail, and then we uh, return to the tank there. Of course, the kit does come with the gauge and it comes with three ORB to AN fittings. For the rest of the lines, I'm using dash six vapor guard, and this is actually designed the fittings and the hose is all designed to work with all kinds of fuel, whether it's gasoline or ethanol, or I think even certain race fuel. So it won't like deteriorate like some traditional AN line will. I know if you have the Teflon line stuff, that'll work with fuel as well. But the Teflon stuff is usually kind of a little bit more pricey where the vapor guard line is a little bit more affordable and it's sort of kind of, I guess, looks factory. Um, there's one more adapter I have that is here. This is what's gonna make the connection on the fuel rail that like uh, male quick connect. So that'll adapt it to dash six AM. And then other than that, I've just got a bunch of random hose ends and stuff. And I got a pile of hose around here somewhere. So, um, oh, also it comes with these, or does it come with it? You gotta buy it. it. Has these Oedeker clamps that you use. These are much better than like threaded hose clamps. I can't stand those. And these kind of sort of look factory. So. Um, that's the parts that we're going to be working with. I'm going to mount the regulator onto the firewall right on those two bolts there. Probably said that already. This is like the zillionth time I've done this take because I, I don't know, every time I do these, I try to say something different, but that's neither here nor there. So let's build a bracket. Let's get the regulator mounted and then we'll connect the fuel lines.
All right, real quick, just kind of wanted to go over some of the ports on the fuel pressure regulator and how you're going to plumb it up. Just about every aftermarket regulator is the same. You've got two ports on the side here. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one is which. This one is going to be coming from the fuel pump, and this one is going to be going to the fuel rail. It doesn't really matter. Um, these are going to be basically your regulated pressure. So when we set this thing at 58 PSI, we're going to have 58 PSI here or here. And this is going to be the return to the fuel tank. So any excess fuel volume is going to go away. Then we have over here just a vacuum reference. We're going to put this on the supercharger lid. I'll show you guys that in just a second. But basically, this will lower the fuel pressure slightly under vacuum, like say when you're idling, or it'll actually raise the fuel pressure under boost. So basic fuel pressure regulator plumbing applies to just about everything. So we've got the fuel system sealed up, it's entirely done, and I think my only complaint about the VaporGuard hose line that I'm using is actually the fittings because there's only three different options available. There's straights, 45s, and 90s, and there's one fitting over here where I really could have used like a 135. It's not like, it's definitely not kinked or bent or anything like that, but I just feel like a 135 would have made for just a little bit cleaner install. Kind of the same thing over here. This, this hose is definitely a little bit more relaxed, but I really wish I could have had a 135. And if it bugs me enough, um, I could easily just swap those three lines out with something from the, I forget whatever other hose line it is, but there's one that has that Teflon liner that's like super great hose, a little more expensive, and that's kind of why I didn't go with it. But um, I kind of wish I did now because I think they have a lot more fittings available in that line. And you're really not supposed to mix and match different hoses and fittings, although you probably could. Um, anyway, that's the regulator mounted. Now we've got to get some boost to it for the vacuum slash boost reference. And on an LSA blower, you've got a couple different options. All these ports up here, you really can't use because this is only vacuum. To get boost, you have to kind of be on the lid side. So you have this port right up front here, which I didn't want to use that because you'd have to run the hoses kind of across everything. And I don't like how that would look. Um, you've got a map sensor here, but this is actually not a manifold pressure sensor. This is just atmospheric pressure. If you can maybe see the port is drilled through there. Um, I've got this covered up with these ICT billet plugs. I've got one here one here and one here, just because I kind of like how that looks and I didn't like the empty hole. Uh, so anyway, that one you can't use for anything useful. Um, you've got the map sensor back there, but of course the map sensor is occupying that space. But I actually found a nifty little gadget from, I believe it was LSX Innovations. It's like a map sensor spacer. Um, it's this guy right here. So the map sensor sits on top. It goes down into the lid and it has two eighth inch NPT ports on it. So we'll use that and one, come on, stay. One of those is going to go to the regulator and the other one is going to go to the boost gauge that we've got 
not yet installed, but I will install it onto the dashboard because you've got to have a boost gauge if you have a blown car or truck. Uh, so anyway, guys, that's going to bring this video to an end. I'm not sure yet what I'm going to do in the next one. I want to get the truck fired up. Uh, I do have a lot of wiring to do, so I might not get it started in the next video, but hopefully very soon we get the LSA fired up. I can't wait to hear how it's going to sound. Um, we're still waiting on a throttle body, a few other odds and ends. I'm going to build a throttle cable bracket, and I don't know. It's like we're making progress, but we also have a long way to go. So thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it. Help me out though and hit that subscribe button because I want to make a big push. I want to get this channel to 100,000 subs. Right now we're like at 72,000 and I want to get there. That is a, a fair amount to go, but with your help, I know we can do it. So thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it and we'll catch you again in a couple of days.